The only way you're going to support free speech, uh, further it, uh, is if you make the hard argument for it. Welcome to Parallax Views, an IEA series of conversations uh, about the politics of culture. My name is Mark Glendenning, and today I'm really pleased to be joined um, by Bryn Harris, who is the Free Speech Union's Chief Legal Counsel. Um, most of the conversations I've been having so far about free speech have focused on the broad principles underlying that value. They have been an attempt also to analyse why it is that across British, so many sections of British society today, uh, there are people agitating for greater speech prohibition. Um, but today is an opportunity for me to try and get a more detailed forensic uh, take from Bryn on the myriad of issues that relate to free speech. Um, I'm keen to get an insight into where he and the Free Speech Union would draw the line between uh, legal and illegal speech, uh, to what extent um, he thinks that free speech is a value that should be imposed on private and public organisations. The more I get into this issue, the, the more I realise that while the principle of free speech is very simple, um, there is a lot of complexity relating to the environments uh, within free speech uh, takes place. Um, let me start, Bryn, by asking you how and why you got involved with the um, Free Speech Union. Yeah, well, thank you, Mark. It's great to, to be here. Um, so um, I, I became interested in uh, free speech issues uh, around about the time of the uh, 2014 uh, Scottish independence referendum. Uh, and it's a bit of a, I was going to say it's a bit of a crooked path, right? So I wouldn't say crooked because that suggests some sort of corruption. It was a sinuous path that I took that led me to the Free Speech Union. Um, and about, about that time, I became very interested in, um, well, particularly the referendum question, but I was also quite concerned by the level of debate, the tone of debate, and the tenor. And uh, it struck me uh, that um, we were actually having quite a poor argument about it. It was full of invective, it was emotional, it was quite nasty. Um, and so I became interested in, well, you know, how can, how can civic debate be improved? How can we uh, do better as civic decision makers entrusted with these huge questions, like should Scotland remain part of the union? Um, so that's when I really became interested in uh, uh, sort of, you know, thinking about free speech and its part in our civic structures. Um, I started uh, volunteering for and eventually directed a charity called uh, Speaker's Corner Trust which um, started out by, by setting up uh, speakers' corners in other parts of the UK, or parts of England, really. Um, so not, not connected to the Hyde Park one, um, but, you know, sort of set up ones in, you know, Litchfield and other places. Um, and the, the purpose behind that charity was to uh, encourage civic debate, you know, to, to, to make us better, you know, public decision makers as voters. Um, and very much a focus on, on dialogue, um, and while I was uh, volunteering there, it was just like an evenings and weekends sort of thing, um, I became very interested in universities as sort of the new front line in the free speech debate. And, um, and I think then that's where you start to see fault lines, a, a particular fault line uh, developing. And so that charity, of which I've got a huge amount of respect, um, formed by Peter Bradley, former MP for the Rekin. Um, I think that was set up in an age where it could be taken for granted that pretty much everyone accepted and believed in free speech as a, as a right and as a, a civic necessity. Um, but I think over time, I think if you want to campaign for free speech, I think now you, you have to be more vocal in making the argument. I think there's a, great, there's a lot more skepticism that you have to overcome. And so it's not enough just to facilitate freedom of speech, to create opportunities for it. I think now you have to make the case for it. Um, 
and, and in a way that means um, not necessarily getting your hands dirty, but entering the arena, um, because it is no longer accepted as an uncontroversial value. Um, so that, there was a sort of, maybe a bit of a parting of ways, because I think that, that that charity wasn't so keen on my more adversarial approach. And um, I, eventually I, I sort of stopped volunteering there because, you know, uh, just busy with other things. And then Toby Young wrote a Spectator article where he put out the call and said, look, I'm setting up the Free Speech Union. Here's my email address if you've got any ideas. Um, so I just got in touch because I'd, you know, I'd done various things at various resources and documents. And I thought if I just pass them to Toby, he can do something with them. Um, and, uh, and that was it. Then, then um, I was sort of pulled into it. Um, uh, rather like Al Pacino in The Godfather Part 3, if we can resume <laughs> our conversation about films. <laughs> they pulled me back in. Um, and so, uh, but I mean, fundamentally, the, the, the thing that really attracted me to the, the Free Speech Union, the FSU, is um, I think Toby fundamentally gets it. I think, I think he, he gets deep down that the only way you're going to support free speech, uh, further it, uh, as if you make the hard argument for it, you know, in a confrontational way if you have to, um, and that we can no longer assume that everyone's going to agree that, oh, it's lovely and a human right and, um, and it's something we should live our lives by. So that's how I came to the FSU. Yes, I mean, that has been a great, I mean, certainly in my lifetime, uh, cultural change when the vast majority of people, you know, when I was first going to university, sort of accepted uh, the value sort of unthinkingly or instinctively. Uh, and then over the past 30 years, particularly and particularly the last 20, um, it's very interesting to see that part of the culture has dramatically changed and that this is not now an accepted value uh, universally at all. And that's quite a chilling yeah. transformation. When I was young, it was essentially religious conservatives who wanted to uh, suppress some of the kind of films we were talking about <laughs> earlier and other things, uh, a slight obsession they had with sex, though they weren't trying to stop people talking politically. Yeah. What's interesting now is that it kind of relates to virtually everything, uh, but it certainly is political. Um, on what basis does the um, FSU decide to take up certain cases and not take them up? And do mm. you also campaign um, for the amendment of existing laws, like, say, the Public Order Act or the Malicious Communications Act or whatever it happens to be? Yep. Or, so, right, OK. Yeah, no, good, well, it's, it's a good question. And uh, the, the first question is, um, uh, you know, it can be quite a tricky one. So um, members uh, pay to subscribe to, to the FSU and, uh, you know, we offer a discretionary legal service uh, that we say that, you know, it's at our discretion um, that we uh, uh, will uh, see if we can provide legal assistance. Um, so, I mean, I think the first criterion is that we, we generally want to help our member. Um, they've paid to join us, they've paid to be part of our movement, um, uh, and therefore we want to, to help them with the dispute that they're in. Now, obviously, that's not the only uh, criterion, and certainly in terms of uh, whether we would provide legal assistance, which could mean you know, up to um, uh, instructing a legal team to go to court or a tribunal. Um, I think the, the further questions, obviously, would be the merits of the case, um, in, in the way that any uh, um, uh, a lawyer would, would assess it. You know, is this likely to win? Is it likely to be a good use of their money? Is it worth the member going through the ordeal of litigation? Uh, which, by the way, everybody almost without fail underestimates uh, just how grueling it is to, to take a claim all the way. Um, and then also, um, you know, because we are this sort of as, as, as your question implied, we are a sort of hybrid organisation. We provide legal assistance, but we also have our own campaigning goals. That means then there are all, you know, other sort of campaigning criteria that we would want to look at. Now, a particular reason why we want to be careful about looking at the merits is 
a scattergun approach where you sort of rush everything to court is, um, uh, it, it is well, it's, you, you know, there's a danger you're going to crash land on the tarmac and create uh, a bad precedent. Um, so it's, um, it's not, it's not risk-free. Obviously, if you win and get a good judgment, especially, you know, in a more senior court, then fantastic. You could have changed the law for the better. If you, you know, rush ahead with a case where maybe the facts aren't great, um, maybe the claim isn't as strong as it could be, then, you know, you probably, we, we would have actively done harm to our campaigning uh, goals because, you know, the courts could have, could rule against, rule against us on free speech. Um, so that's a particular um, goal. And so, you know, we also obviously have uh, particular strategic goals. So, for instance, um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, good case law from the European Court of Human Rights regarding academic free expression. Actually very strong, very strongly uh, uh, protective of academic free expression. Makes clear that it's extremely hard to justify any interference with an academic free expression. Um, but you know, these cases, they're, they're certainly not known to university administrators and leadership. Um, and they're also um, you know, not known to, to a good many practitioners, even in the education sector. Um, and, and also, sorry, I should say the more important thing, they've not been before the English courts. So this is something that we, you know, this is a real strategic objective for us is to find a good case, and say an academic who's been dismissed for exercising free speech rights, trans issues likely to be a, a likely one, um, uh, and then to, you know, run these arguments, to, to put, you know, these judgments before an English court. Um, and to uh, hopefully you know, agree with us that in fact, yes, there is an extremely high level of protection for academic free expression. So that's, that's like a particular sort of strategic objective that might weigh in sort of whether we take a case forward. Um, but I suppose um, what your question was maybe sort of angling for was what do we do with the really sort of nasty cases, you know, where it's someone who said something mm -hmm. pretty reprehensible. Um, and... Um, uh, I think, um, well, there's, there's one thing, we do have our own statement of values, um, whereby we say, well, you know, look, there, there are some things that if you've been horrifically racist, we, we probably won't want to, you know, sort of uh, uh, stand up for your rights or, or, or you know, be associated. Um, I mean, my position, and I'm not going to say this is the FSU's position, is that the greater the interference with liberty, um, the, the more we'd be willing to help nasty cases. So if somebody were dismissed from their job for whatever, espousing fascist views or deeply anti-Semitic or racist views, um, I, you know, there we'd probably err on the side of, well, the employer has their own freedom of association and their own right to say, we'd rather you uh, weren't representing us to customers. If that person loses their liberty and is charged under, for instance, the Public Order Act, then that's a different matter because there's no question there of defending what they said. Um, it's simply making sure um, that the state has got a good reason to interfere with that citizen's liberty. So the, the, the sort of appetite for helping um, uh, uh, with some of the, the fruitier, you know, more offensive cases obviously expands uh, with sort of, the, you know, the greater the, the detriment. Um, so as an example of that, and this, this will take us on to uh, your second question. So uh, we helped Joseph Kelly, who is a uh, Glaswegian laborer, who, um, while tweeting from the pub, uh, let this be a lesson to all of us, while tweeting from the pub, <laughs> uh, commented on uh, the death of Captain uh, Sir Tom Moore, you know, burn in hell, the only good Brit soldier is a dead, dead soldier. Uh, now, he was uh, convicted under the Communications Act, Section 127, for, uh, you know, misuse of an electronic network um, and uh, a grossly offensive message. Um, now, the Communications Act is something that we are, you know, very much, it's very much in our campaigning sites. Um, and in this case, 
um, I'll come on to political action afterwards, but uh, in this case, uh, Mr. Kelly soon exhausted the domestic uh, uh, remedies, and he was in the, the Scottish system, and he soon sort of reached the end of the line there. So um, we helped crowdfund for him to go to, to Strasbourg, to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and there, the, um, the challenge, you know, uh, an important part of the challenge um, is that gross offensiveness um, simply as, as a concept does not have the quality of law, which is to say it's so inherently subjective. Yes, I mean, it's, 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 it's chilling that, you know, state officials, the police, the Crown Prosecution Service can potentially... Yep. take you to court because what is offensive to you is not necessarily offensive to me and even if it is so what I exactly mean, yeah. we're, we're adults we're not you know in the kindergarten I mean exactly yeah. and you, I mean you know in, in this yeah. case of course you know he was he was, he made the comment about someone who had just died so you know so Tom didn't suffer any detriment you know it wasn't it wasn't yeah. a, a racist comment or anything like that so it's hard, you know it's hard to see really what harm was done by this this you know deeply off color mm -hmm. comment um, but I mean, you know, certainly that, I mean, that, so that is the, the line of attack with, with that appeal, which is being brought by um, Fred McIntosh Casey and Cameron Smith, um, that, you know, it, it, it is so arbitrary, it's so hard for there to be a legal measuring stick for what constitutes offensiveness, um, that, it, that it simply, you know, doesn't have the quality. So this case is ongoing, is it? It is. It's with the, the registry um, in, in Strasbourg at the moment. Right. Um, now, um, I mean, what, one reason why it was particularly important at the time was that um, uh, at the time England was uh, uh, choosing to, to ditch Section 127 of the Communications Act and replace it with a new um, uh, uh, harmful communications offence. Uh, and this was on the recommendation of the Law Commission, uh, which, uh, while we don't agree with all of its uh, positions, particularly on hate speech, uh, it did produce a very um, thoughtful report on reform of uh, hate crime. And this, this would have resulted, however, in, in England having a, a more liberal regime and Scotland retaining Section 127. So that was one particular reason why we thought it was very important to help Mr Kelly go to Strasbourg. Um, as it happened, in the end, because um, of the shenanigans with the online safety bill, England is actually going to stick with Section 127 and the Malicious Communications Act. Um, so it remains uh, a, uh, a campaigning uh, aim of ours to, to get it replaced with um, a, uh, uh, you know, something that, that doesn't have this uh, extraordinarily subjective element. Um, and you mentioned as well the Public Order Act. Um, which um, you know regularly comes up. For instance, universities will often cite it in their free speech codes of practice as sort of one of the legal bases on which they can interfere with free speech. Um, slightly fancifully, because I, I can't imagine there's ever been any prosecution of a student uh, for breach of the Public Order Act on, in, in campus. Um, but there was an interesting case recently concerning James Allchurch, who was just convicted in, uh, in Wales for a series of um, uh, really fascist and anti-Semitic podcasts. Um, there's not so much I can say about it because I've not read the sentencing remarks, but I think there is something there that, that should really um, potentially be a concern for us all because um, the, the test... Um, uh, for being convicted under the, the incitement, the racial incitement parts of the act are you know, whether you intended to stir up racial hatred or whether it was likely that um, racial hatred was likely to be stirred up. There are other elements as well, but we'll just look at, look at those. Um, and I think the, the problem is, is that there's no, uh, or I can find no, um, judicial guidance on what stirring up means. A lot of the other elements have been, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, discussed and ruled on by the courts. But this question, what does it mean to stir up hatred? Um, 
So it's, it's, that, that wording has been on the statute books since 1965 with the Race Relations Act. Um, and I find it quite troubling that it's not been expounded on because it, it's not clear. I mean, it's metaphorical language, if anything, to stir up. Um, and it, it could uh, apply to a range of sort of uh, cases from sort of weak cases to strong cases. Now, obviously, um, someone who says to a group of acolytes who hang on every word of this leader of whatever, a sect or a group who says, go out and smash windows of this community. Well, you know, there's very obvious proximity to actual violence there because the, that person speaking knows or should know that their followers will go out and do that. Just like when an army officer shouts fire, he knows that his soldiers will do exactly that. So the, the, the word is very close to the deed. But isn't certainly. one problem for me as a, a sort of free speech libertarian partisan fanatic um, that I don't believe any human being can be stirred up by another human being. I mean, if you were to tell me to do something, um, ultimately I have agency, I decide whether yeah. I'm going to. So if you have some rabble-rousing person, let us say maybe an anarchist or a Marxist who's saying, go and you know, smash up the homes of the bourgeoisie or um, kill them in their beds. These are just words. Yeah. The, the, nobody has to act upon this. And if they do, it seems to me they are morally responsible, not the person who's doing the stirring up. But, but, I, but I mean, I think... I know it's a position a lot of people wouldn't but, <laughs> accept. But I think, no, I mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think you're right, but I think there has to be um, a, a, a certain gradation. So, for instance, nobody... Let's say you have an army officer who is, who is up in court for illegal orders where he's, he's ordered his soldiers to fire on a crowd. Now, it, it, nobody would think that that army officer has a free speech defence. No, nobody would think. He said, when I said fire, I was expressing right. my free speech rights. Now, for all of us, we'd say, well, that's an order. And but you, he's in a rather different context to a rabble-rousing... Well, he might be, uh, but then... ...political activist on a soapbox. But then, you know, I mean, yeah. let, let's think of, of someone who... who mm -hmm you know, perhaps has some sort of position within a community, maybe there's some sort of uh, uh, thought leader or maybe a religious leader. Now, obviously, there's not the same legal obligation as applies between the army officer uh, and, you know, his platoon. Um, but nevertheless, there's, there's still um, significant awareness in the mind of, of that uh, leadership figure that their words will translate into actions. But, I mean, I think the yeah. nub, the nub that we're coming to, though, um, well, sorry, first of all, what, I, what I, I want to say, though, is that I think this needs to be, must be clearly bright line distinguished from um, mere persuasion. So if I, if I said, maybe, you know, maybe fallaciously, maybe completely wrongly, from facts A, B, and C, I deduced this about this minority group, and if I merely stated it as a, you know, uh, 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 what I believe to be fact or an opinion, um, that I think should never count as incitement. The fact that it might stir up hatred in another person in the sense that they may agree, they may be persuaded, I think that needs to be carved out. We need to say that is not stirring up. Stirring up is always something that is more likely to lead directly to, to action, to violence, to harm. So, you know, getting sort of towards the JS Mill mm -hmm sort of harm principle, but just returning, so, so I mean, that's, that's definitely my view, that that's why we need to think more carefully, what does stirring up mean? We, we must ensure that it doesn't catch mere persuasion. But to go back to your, your point, uh, I mean, I think the philosophical difficulty that you, you, you know, uh, uh, that a libertarian might have with the Public Order Act is, is that it's just that, it's an act to protect public order. Um, uh, and the law would look at it as, uh, you know, as are these acts likely to, I don't want to say breach the peace, because that's a separate, um, a, a, a separate legal provision, but um, you know, is, is, it, is the net um, outcome of it, regardless of people's individual free conscience, is it likely to result in disturbance and disorder? Um, now, I mean, I'm, uh, we might come back to this 
with some of the other things we're, we're going to talk about. I think if, if you are in exceptional circumstances where there is a great danger to the public, if there's a tinderbox situation, we know if you're trying to stop uh, black shirts, you know, roaming through cable streets, uh, intimidating the Jewish community, if you're worried that it's going to kick off, which is obviously where the first Public Order Act came from, um, then I think it can be justifiable. The, the, the problem, though, is that these, these pieces of legislation tend not to go from the statute book once the tinderbox situation has passed. And I think that's the, a danger. Um, one, of the, one of your great successes recently um, has been the blocking of the Worker Protection Act, which was an amendment proposed by two Liberal Democrat uh, politicians to, I think, the Equality Act, um, which, it, while it has been blocked for the time being, it nevertheless offers a sort of an extraordinary insight, does it not, into the minds of some in the speech prohibitionist movement, whereby employers, as far as I understand it, and I know you, you did a lot of work on this, could be sued by their own employees for overhearing or being subjected to uh, spoken words in the workplace or in their work environment by yeah. clients. Yes, that's pretty Now, nice. it seems to me that these so-called liberal Democrats um, are wanting to establish complete state surveillance mm. um, over every area of civil society uh, and to actually criminalise potentially or certainly bring the law into the sphere of private conversations, which has already happened in Scotland, yeah. which I know, I know the Law Commission for England and Wales at one time were advocating mm -hmm. for down south as well. I mean, this is a really disturbing development, isn't it? Yeah, so um, it, it is, and let's hope we are sort of past that, that danger. I mean, it might help to sketch out some of the, the background to the bill. So um, when the Equality Act was enacted in 2010, uh, there was originally a provision for um, a, a liability for third-party harassment. So this said that... Um, uh, if a, a third party harassed an employee and if there, if there had been two previous occasions of this harassment um, taking place um, then the uh, employer could be liable to that employee um, if they hadn't taken all reasonable steps or I think such, re such steps that were reasonably practical to prevent that harassment. So that was the original uh, Section 41 on the Equality Act as enacted. Now, um, the coalition government of all people uh, in 2013 uh, repealed Section 41 and took it out of the um, out of the Equality Act uh, as part of a sort of um, red tape reform, you know, trying to remove um, unnecessary burdens on business. And the position of the uh, government was that. Well, for it had hardly ever been litigated. Uh, it didn't seem to be used much, and there were other means um, of, of achieving the same end. Um, fast forward to uh, roundabout 2018, don't quote me. Um, you get the President's Club, Farago, where there'd been this, this pretty awful, sleazy. Uh, um, alleged sexual harassment of waitresses at this um, sort of club dinner for, for CEOs. Um, now, um, this, this prompted two things, starting with the Fawcett Society and then also uh, with I think the Women's Inequalities Committee in the House of Parliament. Uh, asking for two things. First, greater protection for employees against sexual harassment, which I think is uncontroversial. I've got no issue with that. But for some reason... <laughs> Somewhere along the way, they tacked on third-party harassment there as well. So there, was, but there, there wasn't any, or I didn't see any, clear reflection on um, 
either how those two hung together conceptually or uh, how the evidence that was coming in, uh, real evidence coming in of uh, employees, mainly female employees, being sexually harassed. There was no, uh, no, seemed to be no reflection on how that evidence would necessitate the reintroduction of third party harassment. But they were just sort of bundled together in this slightly lazy way. So, um, in terms of how did we get there, and, and then, then, sorry, I mean, eventually there's a government uh, 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 inquiry, consultation. The government says it will reintroduce. Well, essentially, we'll introduce the Worker Protection Bill, um, and eventually they do it through a private member, members bill brought by um, Vera Hopkins and a uh, lord, yes, and Baroness, uh, Baroness or that, but anyway, yeah. yeah. So that, that's that's how we that's how we got there to, to, to sort of get some of the facts uh, down. Um, I mean, I do think I mean, this is pure speculation on my part. I mean, I, I do, I, I do think that that part of the impetus. Um, in, in, in trying to, to reintroduce third-party harassment was um, almost a pure power play that because the Equality Act is um, pretty much a sacred text for a number of people who hold quite a lot of institutional, institutional cultural power, I think there was a, a feeling of sort of less majest that they'd, 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 they'd dared to take it away. Uh, in 2013, right. and so it was a sort of it's almost an act of restoration, um, a sort of restoration of, of you know sort of um, of privileges almost. So I think there's there's an element of sort of you know putting right um, what what the coalition government had dared to do to the Equality Act. Um, but I think as well there's a great degree of intellectual laziness, if I can if I can call it that, in terms of that there wasn't any attempt to. To think, or no, no ostensible attempt to think through, uh, first of all, why it was necessary, how the evidence, um, you know, created an argument for its necessity, um, and also, I mean, probably most damningly, there, there seemed to be little consideration of the enormous impact that this would have on. I mean, employers would have to presumably sort of put up signs in pubs, and restaurants, and in football stadiums sort of outlining the type of topics that could and could not be uh, discussed, kind of words that shouldn't be used, because I think the amendment says, you know, they have to take all reasonable steps, yeah. whatever, again, that means. So the implications are pretty uh, yeah. horrific. But I mean, this attempt to um, uh, regulate mm. private speech. I mean, we also see in another context I'm keen to, to ask you about mm. um, this attempt. So, for example, there's a Conservative MP, I think, called Alicia Kearns. She wants to make it illegal for um, anybody to have a conversation with a person, a trans person, who is thinking of going down the road of um, having a sex change operation. I mean, not that you can change sex through the operation, but okay. anyway, that's the theory is that you can. Um, and she wants to make it illegal to engage in, I think what she calls LGBT plus conversion yep. therapy. So a psychotherapist would be banned by law from offering his or her opinion to a client. So it's as if mm. you had somebody who was, say, suffering from anorexia. Yeah. And the law said, well, you're only allowed to affirm that this is actually a good path of development yep. for you. I mean, this is incredible stuff, isn't it? I mean, this is really Orwellian, sort of proto-fascistic, in my opinion. Yes, yeah, so, so let's start with, so we'll get on to, to conversion therapy, because I guess we, we don't know, I don't think there's a bill yet, with it's coming, it's likely to be awful, is what we're hearing. Um, but we'll, I'll come on to, to that. But I mean, what, what I'm interested in first is the, the issue you, you touch upon of regulation by law of what one might call mere interactions. Um, so the law is practiced, and in fact, it's, it's, I think, appropriately used to regulate those who have decision-making power. Um, because decisions are taken through a process and the law can 
regulate processes, and that's what it's there for. Uh, and the law is also there to uh, regulate or prevent the abuse of power. So, for instance, and I don't know if you and I will, will agree on this, but I mean, I think it is entirely appropriate for the law to restrain the power of an employer uh, who may wish to dismiss an employee and, and you know, perhaps uh, uh, sort of harm a person's sort of a, 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 a free route through the job market um, on the basis of their race. Now, I think that is an abuse of the employer's decision-making power. And I think the law should step in, as, as the Equality Act does, to, to restrain that. And that's because the employer has great power, um, it has a power that affects the liberty of that person and their liberty to find a job, to interact with the job market. Um, and I think the law should say it may not be abused um, in the name of some racial malice. And, and so to, to that extent, the provisions of the Equality Act or the, the, the basic sort of discrimination provisions are pretty un, uncontroversial. Um, and some people... So I'm going to get to the bad bits, um, but then those those bits I think are, are uncontroversial. And you know, even though the the Equality Act essentially codifies various EU directives, um, nevertheless, you know, the UK Parliament, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of um, stood against this far before we joined the EU in 1965. So you know, e even if Parliament hadn't legislated even if we'd not been part of the EU. I'm pretty sure that the basic liberal decency of the common law would always have said, no, a master or an employer cannot abuse his power over an employee purely uh, out of racial malice. So I think there are, there are some aspects of the Equality Act that I think you know, are, are, are pretty basic and, and we have to keep because those are regulating decision-making power. What I think is very wrong with the Equality Act, it's particularly Section 109, um, which says, and, and this is of a piece with what you were talking about regarding third-party interactions, which says that um, uh, essentially the, what's well, Section 1, 110, really, and 109, that the employer can be liable for acts of harassment in particular, uh, but any breach, but let's focus on harassment. Employer can be liable for any act of harassment carried out by um, its employee. So that therefore means that any interactions between employees uh, are potentially a legal mind minefield, potentially a source of liability for the employer, such that it's entirely reasonable for them to regulate, police, uh, uh, how their employees talk to one another. Now, for me, that is where we cross a sort of uh, 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 sort of into a different conceptual category, whereby the law is regulating interactions, not decision making carried out by a process, but interactions between free persons. And that is where I think it goes astray, and you know, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, first, I don't think in a free, liberal, democratic society, the force of law should be felt over our shoulder quite so ubiquitously. I don't think free citizens live their day-to-day -day life in canteens, work kitchens, overseen by law. I think the, the other reason, um, I think, is that, uh, I mean, I generally start from the presumption of law's inadequacy, um, which is to say that the rules set by law, by, by parliament, for instance, um, uh, will always, al almost always be too general and too broad to catch the infinite variegation of experience. And that therefore, we only need law when there's a serious injustice that we couldn't otherwise prevent. Now, my belief, and this is a rather long way around of explaining it, isn't it? But I think all of us are able to, to, to rationalise offensive things being said to us. We don't necessarily need the law to step in to protect us from 
are uh, offensive. Well, it's infantilizing us. I mean, it, 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 it's extraordinary that um, there are some people who want to treat us and have us treated as if we were children um, with no capacity to absorb uh, the sometimes hurtful yeah. things other people say, which is just part of adult life. So they're trying to turn, as it were, the whole of society into a sort of university safe space. Yeah. Where, and, but adult life shouldn't be about being in a safe space. Um, you can't live in a safe space um, unless you take yourself off to, yep. you know, to live in Snowdonia or somewhere, or the Highlands of Scotland. But life isn't about that. Yeah. No, I, th I think I agree. I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to split hairs a little bit. I mean, mm. so first of all, generally, now you, know, you, you may well disagree with this. I mean, um, to me, my, my view on the Equality Act is that um, those sorts of interactions, or well, basic interactions between employees, uh, are just not within the province of law at all. Um, obviously, the, the Equality Act um, doesn't regulate all of our behaviour. It, it, it only regulates certain interactions by, by certain people. Um, now, my default position is that our basic moral judgment as free citizens uh, is generally more sophisticated and flexible than any test that could be imposed by a court. I mean, people's, you know, just general moral rationalization is, is probably more reliable for having a fair society than, than law. But nevertheless, I can see the argument that there are particular forms of uh, um, uh, social risk where it can be appropriate for the law to step in. That is to say, the law's got no business saying um, don't offend one another. Potentially, I mean, I, and I probably don't agree, but potentially it can be right to say you must not offend each other on the basis of race or religion um, because that could be particularly deleterious to, to, to public safety and peace. Now, I know you, you might disagree with that. You can, I'm you horrified. Can, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, but, but no, I mean, I mean look, yes. I mean, if you think... If you think of, of, a, of a society... But, I mean, like, that would be grounds, for example, sorry to interrupt, no. for, say, ban an orange march through the middle of Glasgow or Belfast, because clearly there are going to be people, say, of the Catholic persuasion or uh, sensitivity who don't like that, and vice versa with an Irish Republican march through the middle of Glasgow. I mean, well, you, tough, you know, we're citizens, other people have the right to march about and well, you, say things yeah. we don't like You've shot about my, our religion or our politics. You've shot my fox there, because the example I was going to bring <laughs> oh, up was sorry. What, what, what we do in a place like Belfast, <laughs> but yeah. we're, we're expression of those. <laughs> of those uh, uh, beliefs, you know, could be extremely inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I, perhaps I take a more pragmatic view, or perhaps you say an unprincipled view, um, that I can sort of foresee that in certain exceptional cases, that a balance has to be made between untrammeled expression, uh, free expression, mm -hmm. um, and uh, preservation of life and limb. Uh, now, obviously, so, so you know, I think I think that that case can be made, and I I think that's perhaps the the justification of the Equality Act. That most of the time we can be relied upon as educated citizens to use our moral judgment to rub along well together. But then Parliament has said, but then there are these particularly risky areas where there's danger of inequality uh, um, uh, 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 sort of creeping in, or, or you know, the, the creation of underclasses based on certain characteristics. Um, so I can, I can get it, I don't necessarily support it, uh, particularly because if those social conditions ever change, let's say, in fact, you know, racism, uh, uh, homophobia, misogyny, let's say they become far less uh, prevalent, let's say they disappear from us, it's like you can guarantee that the act wouldn't disappear with it. So there is a ratchet effect um, with this sort of legislation. But the main, um, one of my main problems is um, that we, we, we underestimate how suggestible we all are before the power of legal rules. So for instance, 
if you take someone who's a very skilled and careful and prudent driver, and let's say, you know, most of the time when, when they're driving, they're able to use their judgment to drive safely for themselves and for other users and for passengers. Nevertheless, that person, when they drive through a 20 zone, will decide, I will just drive at 20. I will not use my judgment or my discretion or my skills as a driver. I will subordinate it entirely and I will simply drive at 20. Most of us would do that. Um, and we do it fairly automatically. And we, we sort of switch off you know, many of the things that we normally use. Um, and my concern is that the Equality Act is basically relegated an entire area of moral reflection and, and moral action to mere compliance. You know, employers will mm. tell you about equality in the same, with the same automaticity and, and narrow-mindedness as they'll tell you about fire alarms and uh, health and safety. So, you know, this area which is in fact complex, which is, you know, which merits reflection, um, has become something that we don't think about. You don't need to think about how to treat others fairly and decently. You just need to comply. And obviously, the more that you do that, you know, the more that we damage our actual ability to think carefully and properly about these. And I think this is one, this, for me, this is one explanation why so much EDI sort of rhetoric uh, is incredibly poor. You know, it's often you know, has this, this, this element of automatic thinking um, and, you know, and, and this sort of reliance on boilerplate. And I think it's because... But that's because it, they want submission. I mean, they want us to um, subjugate our judgment and our beliefs to the values they want to impose, it would seem to me. That's well, they, they, they could entirely do. deliberate. They could do. I mean, I, mean, I think that's... I'm sure I'm, there, there, there are some people... Are doing that, and it must that must be their their purpose. But I think that's a strong explanation. But I think perhaps a a, a, a weaker explanation is that this this automaticity, this, this reliance on boilerplate, is a simple corollary that we've removed questions of diversity and equality from the area of moral controversy and reflection and argument, and it's simply something we comply with with the same automaticity as we comply with speed limits, fire extinguishers, you know. Yeah. And, and, and it's an enormous trivialization. And I think this is, you know, the, 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 the difficulty with our, the selling this argument is that, I mean, a lot of the, the high-minded people who, 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 who uh, you know, sacralize the, the Equality Act and who strongly rely on it, you know, they, they tend to think they're very clever and they probably wouldn't like the argument that, that they're also responsible for a great cretinization of uh, um, much of our discourse. But I, I think that genuinely is the problem. But, uh, and, 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 you know, this isn't too radical. But what we're talking about really is a sort of, uh, um, like J.S. Mill's notion of the, the dead letter, that when you demand mere compliance, such that people don't reach their principles through a process of argument and reflection and free exploration, they become dead letters. The, the principles that un underpin them wither away, and and you just have these sort of sterile, um, uh, you know, rather lifeless uh, uh, sort of dogmas. And I think that's very much the danger that the Equality Act poses. That it um, it reduces the quality of thinking and debate and reflection that goes into these actually very important mm. moral um, concepts. Because of course, equality is important in a democracy. Nothing, nothing is more important. Than, than, than equality. Nothing's more important than equality before the law. So I, th I think it's a real risk. Um, but uh, I, I don't see it being uh, tinkered with by Parliament anytime soon. No, sadly. Um, so I think I'm going to throw it open to our members of the audience now oh, if they have uh, any questions, and then I might come back with a final question yeah, sure. for you. So I don't know if... Anybody would like to make a comment or ask Bryn a question? You must disagree with something you've heard, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Uh, I've got a question. Great. I'll start off. Um, so it was mainly a question regarding when you guys mentioned an employer's freedom of association mm. versus an employee's free speech or right to free speech. So where is the line drawn over there? 
So at what point can an employer justifiably cut ties with an employee over concerns regarding certain kinds of speech, be that hate speech or such? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, so um, we were talking earlier about sort of strategic objectives of, of the FSU. And certainly one thing that we are keen to push back upon is when uh, employers cite non-compliance with our values. They say that this employee doesn't fit our values. Um, and um, you do get into a, a very you can get into difficult territory. Now, I think the, 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 the baseline for me is that there's a legitimate scope to the employment relationship, that your employer can buy your labor and can buy your time, uh, but can't buy uh, a window into your soul. Um, and so f for me, that is um, one potential way in which we might draw that line. We'll say, well, look, what is legitimately part of the business relationship that you have as employer and employee? Um, and then, you know, what is uh, uh, beyond that and therefore essentially abusing the relationship to, so as to secure um, some sort of ideological end? Um, but I, I think it, it, will be, um, it will be very difficult. Um, because any law, I mean, again, we're going back to the inadequacy of law. You know, any, any law that were to, to, to apply to this would have to apply to the however many sort of millions of, of employees there are out there. Now, if you look at someone, for instance, who is explicitly made or explicitly agrees to be, in contractual terms, an ambassador for their organization, if they're told that, you know, your conduct represents us and we expect you to be an ambassador for the organization, uh, then as long as that commitment was, was freely made and, and, it, and it was very clear that, that that was going to be an obligation on the employee, then obviously uh, I, I think to a degree that that means that employee with, with their eyes open has said, well, I agree to perhaps um, a, 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 le well, a lessening of my right to speak freely. Um, but I, I think it will be very difficult to, to draw the line, yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a question from Mark as well before I hand it off. So when talking about stirring violence or inciting violence, um, you said that these are just words and everyone has agency. You don't have to act on them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't you make the argument that certain people have reduced agency to act independently due to the power, be it a rabble rouser, a political actor, may have over them, or they just possess in general due to their position? No, I, I fundamentally disagree with the premise of what you're saying because we either all have free will by virtue of the fact we're human beings or we don't. And so therefore I don't really accept the, the idea that there are some sort of superhumans who can somehow direct you and me against our will to do, commit some other regarding act against another human being. So obviously this is very typical, isn't it, with the case of Donald Trump and the, you know, the riots on Capitol Hill. Um, it seems to me that you know, the people who stormed the Senate building are entirely responsible for their own actions. And lots of people heard the same speech and didn't go and do anything in any way. The words were pretty pretty vague, I think, from yeah. the Donald. So, um, yeah, I, I just don't accept. I think it's, we have to take, as adults, we have to take responsibility for our own lives and our own actions. I don't know, do you want but, to come back on that? Yeah, before? I mean, but, I mean it's, but, but if we say there's a clear causal link, so if we say that but for this person stirring things up, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, and let's say that this person who did stir up did it with bad intent that they, they wanted violence to, to ensue. I don't see, from that, I don't see necessarily why we need to uh, uh, sort of think about the free will of these people who were incited. It's I enough, see, it's okay. enough to say, well, this person acted in a bad way, uh, with, you know, with, with mens rea, um, and, and um, there was a causation of, of that harm. You know, that w without this person standing there on the podium wagging their finger, um, those bricks wouldn't have been put through windows. So, I mean, I, 
Um, I, I mean, I, I do agree with you that it, there's, it can treat people as, as automatons, but you know, I think really the focus is on the person doing the incitement um, and what they cause and, and what they intend. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm the free speech guy. I'm coming out as the <laughs> the one less in favour of free speech. Yeah. Well, as I said uh, in my introductory remarks, it is it is a a very philosophically complex and fascinating area of debate because it does connect with you know um, ontology and um, so very fundamentally philosophical questions. So, but I mean, for, for what for what it's worth, though, I mean, we just just to briefly revisit that. No, I mean, like I said, I do. Uh, I mean, I I do agree that that. That I do believe, sorry, that, that someone who should know that their words will have the effect of producing certain actions, um, I think that person can be liable. But I think the effect of that is, is that it would be almost impossible to prosecute. I think it would be extremely difficult to prove that someone knew that their words had such a hold over other people and that they intended it. So um, I, I, I think the net, the net effect might be to your liking and that mm -hmm. it would make public order acts or at least incitement uh, uh, um, uh, laws uh, to have very very little or no effect. Anybody else would like to come in? I do have a question. I don't know if it kind of piggybacks of what you just said, but um, in terms of kind of this idea of um, being punished for inciting... Do you want to speak, sorry, into oh, sorry. that? Yeah. Um, in practicality, um, I would take... I would totally understand um, kind of why theoretically that should be punished because ethically you could argue it's the same thing. But just in practicality, do you think there's ever a way to really kind of punish that in an effective way just because, like you said, it is so hard to know what somebody's intent is and can you ever really punish intent if you don't truly, you're not truly able to prove it? Yeah, I mean, I mean so, so, so that's, that's a problem with, you know, virtually all criminal law, how, how do you prove uh, the intent of the person who is acting, um, given that we, we generally don't signpost our intention, we just, we just do it. Um, so therefore it becomes a question of, you know, what, can you infer their intent from, from what they were uh, doing and saying? Um, now, I mean, you, you know, there's certainly one, one controversial aspect of um, our incitement laws is, um, and, and our public order laws is that there are some, um, uh, uh, some sort of l l lower levels of uh, uh, mens rea. So for instance, in terms of, in, of stirring up racial hatred, um, it's either that you intend to stir it up um, or that it was likely to be stirred up and you intended to say something that was insulting. So, um, obviously, with, with, with intent, I mean, that's, that's the, you know, generally the best protection of liberty. So, uh, you know, you, you, somebody can only be liable if, if they actually intended it. So you, you, can't, you can't be criminalized because, you, you know, you accidentally committed a crime. Um, so that, that there is an argument for, for saying that, especially provisions like this, which can potentially affect free speech so much, there's an argument for saying that they should be intent only uh, uh, offences and that there shouldn't be any criminal liability just because you did something that was likely to um, stir up hatred or was likely to cause harassment, alarm um, or distress. So I mean, and I think I would, um, uh, I, I, I would agree with that, but uh, I, I do accept that you're still left with the general question of how do you prove their intent? Um, and the question is, uh, we cross-examine witnesses before a jury of um, 12 people on the electoral roll, and we see, do you believe that they had the intent or not? Which pieces of legislation at the moment relating to free speech um, uh, do, not, do not require mens rea to have been established when prosecuting somebody? I mean... It... Well, so... Um, Re uh, stirring up racial hatred has a um, a, a likely to so, th so that's intent or um, stirring up hatred is likely so that's sort of section 19 on public order act 
Um, I think the other identity, uh, you're really putting me on the spot here, Mark. The, you know, the other uh, identity-based uh, stirring up provisions, I think, are intent only. And then, so section five of the Quality Act, which is the basic um, uh, uh, sort of using um, abusive or threatening words with intent to cause harassment, alarm, or distress, uh, that also has a, um, an alternative of that, you know, you should have known that someone would, would be caused harassment, alarm, or distress. Um, and if that was wrong, then your, your listeners can, can uh, write In fact, I was deliberately <laughs> testing you as the chief legal counsel, but I did. Did I pass? You know, yeah. <laughs> um, is there a last question? Uh, Comment? Would you like to? Um, this is also on um, the power of words and the ability to like stir up um, emotions in other people um, and actions. Um, but given that people have different mental capacities, sort of innately, um, like independent of the power of other people to influence um, your words, people have like innately different mental capacities to um, hold independent thoughts um, or uh, due to like mental health problems, not because of um, a particularly influential figure, for example. Um, do you th um, it seems kind of like unjust to have a moral code um, for like free freedom of speech when you have uh, when you consider um, that pe that your intent could diverge so much from the consequences of your words. Um, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. So um, yes, yeah, so so you know should. Um, uh, uh, should should someone be liable simply because uh, of a, an unreasonable reaction of another person who perhaps should have taken a more reasonable interpretation of what you said? Is that is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, just just switching briefly from um, uh, uh, from sort of criminal incitement and just looking at the employment context and the the Equality Act. Um, now, I, I, I think, uh, again, I'm going to be the real sort of wet rag against Glenn Denning's uh, tough libertarian, but, you know, the, the, the Equality Act does have a, a test. It says, um, well, first of all, it says for, for non-intentional harassment, and that in itself is a minefield, the, the idea that anyone could be liable for unintentional harassment. But it does say um, that uh, the court has to take into account the perception of the complainant, and whether it was reasonable in those circumstances for them to feel harassed. Um, now, the, the problem that I've got, aside from whether there should even be such a thing as unintentional harassment, um, is that I think most of us in our day-to-day -day lives are actually far more flexible and nimble in the way that we rationalize what people say to us. So for instance, we see a lot of stuff at universities um, about decolonizing curriculums, which talk about the, the awfulness of white people, basically. So you know, about white fragility, white privilege. And now there are some people who want to say, well, look, that's harassment. That's harassment towards white people. Um, now I personally don't really care that much. Now possibly that's because I'm at the I, I, I hold power as a white person, a white male. Maybe, maybe the, 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 sort of, um, the sort of woke people have a point. But alternatively, it, it's probably because I'm just able to rationalize it because I sort of think well, these people are probably just pursuing something fashionable. It's probably just a bit of group think. Um, you know, may, maybe they're, they're just showing off a bit. Maybe they're, dare I say it, a bit dim, you know, and I just, uh, so it's, we all have lots of ways just to, to rationalize things that come in towards us, which, which allow us to say, well, actually, you know what, this, this doesn't really do me any harm. I don't, I don't really feel that, that threatened by, you know, talk about sort of white fragility or, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I just think that no legal test could ever be as sophisticated as those day-to-day -day rationalizations even though the law tries to get it, I don't think it can. Um, and I think that they are a much, always a much better defense. Um, but then the question is, sorry, I'm, I'm finally coming around to your question, so sorry. Um, 
should we also then say that the law should expect everyone else to um, be able to carry out those rationalizations? So if someone says, look, uh, you know, I was, I was in my, my job and somebody, I overheard someone telling a pretty frightful joke about group X, um, the, the question would be a difficult question for me is, should we say, well, look, as a citizen, you have a duty to be as reasonable as you can. You, you could have rationalized this. You could have said, well, that guy is 65 and he ser served in the merchant navy for 50 years. So, you know, maybe he's, you know, maybe, maybe he didn't mean offense. Um, and for me, yeah, obviously, I don't think any, any employment tribunal is going to say anything like that at any time soon. But, um, yeah, that's a difficult thing for me. I mean, I, I probably um, err towards thinking that we have every right to demand that citizens who have been compulsorily educated can be expected to show a degree of rationality, and if they don't, uh, tough. Um, but, uh, but I think it's still a difficult question. Uh, Bryn, thank you so much for taking the time Not at all. To, to be with us. Um, and, you know, the work of your organisation is, is really superb. Um, and I think all of us who hold politically, if not necessarily economically, liberal values should be very grateful for the fact that you exist and that um, you don't just talk about uh, freedom of speech as a incredibly important uh, value, but that you're actually on the legal front line fighting for it. So thank you very much for joining us and taking our questions. Thank you, Mark. Great to be here. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.